Floods of joy may come over our soul, but clapping and singing at the same time is difficult for some of us. Yeah. Hey, today is uh, the next time of knowing and growing the family of God, and we have the privilege this morning of getting ready to know a little bit better Rick and Tammy Chuny. So will you greet them as they come forward? We have a couple of mics. You guys doing? Good. 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 That's good. <laughs> I can't take them anyway. <laughs> All right. Question for you, and I think you've seen these. <clears throat> Can you tell us just a little bit about yourselves? Oh, you want me to go first? Okay. Um, let's see. Well, I'm originally from Denison, uh, proper. That's the address anyway, but it was really, and I lived in the country outside a really small town called Midvale. Sandy, you may be familiar with that. I'm not sure who else might be, but that's where I'm from. I went to Claymont City Schools. Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. Oh, I just wasn't holding it close enough. Um, anyway, I went to Claymont City Schools. Go Mustangs. Yay. And, uh, I went to the College of Worcester, and graduated from there in 88, and then I went on to work for Social Security. So I was there for 28 years and retired early after I met this guy. All right, all right. So if you have any Social Security questions, <laughs> this is the person to ask, okay? I all right. I retired five years ago, and they change things continually, so I might be rusty, but I can still look things up. So. All right, good. Hey, Rick, tell us a little bit about you. Okay, I... Uh, Actually, I was not born in Orville, but I was raised here. Was born in West Virginia. Elkin. Yeah. Hey. All right. All right. All the hillbillies. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, we, uh, my family migrated north in the early 60s to work, for work up here, Baldy Castings, and uh, that's where most everybody went. So I graduated high school here and did not want to work at quality casting, so I went in the Army. And spent 22 years in the Army, retired, and started working at quality casting. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's how that worked. Um, okay, yeah, that. And then I uh, wound up Retiring from the Army, working at Quality Castings for a few years, and now we're both retired. 
All right. All right. Okay. How long have you guys been Christians? Um, well, I was baptized when I was nine years old um, at the Christian temple in Eurexville. I don't know if you're familiar with that or not, but since then. All right. Since nine years old. Mm -hmm. Long time. Pretty much. And Rick? Uh, just a couple of years ago. A couple of years right ago. Here, uh, was baptized right here at the Orville Baptist Church. All right. Mm -hmm. And I remember that with great appreciation. I do too. Yes. yes. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. What brought you here to Orville Baptist Church? A uh, couple things. A wedding. Uh, my niece and nephew were married here. Mandy, Linda's daughter. Oh, like maybe some of you don't know, I'm Linda Sandmeyer's brother. Her. Uh, the better looking older brother. Yeah. <laughs> uh, her brother Gary is the tough guy. I'm the pretty one. Right. So. But uh, her daughter Mandy was married here. Um, we came for that. And then I had a little heart attack and wound up in cardiac rehab with brother Jim, Paul. And uh, so we got to talk, huh? Very. Oh, I'm sorry, Jim. I'm sorry. Yeah. And uh, uh, he invited us to a play you guys had going on at the time. So we came to the play and the wedding, and finally we just decided, you know, we're spending a lot of time here. We might as well just we might as well start coming. And he yeah. knew he knew so many people that he didn't realize, and he's like, oh, it's just a really nice church, and. We fit well, and we should go there, so I was pleased. All right, yes, and we're pleased too, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. All right. All right, and I don't know the answer to this, but the question was, tell us one thing about you that we don't know. Um, we talked about this yesterday. What, what am I going to say? Um, I spent a year in Spain. Um, oh, wonderful. Through the College of Worcester, they kind of had an exchange with uh -huh. a number of schools so i spent a year in spain how was yeah, that my, it was wonderful was it was beautiful it? Yes. yeah all right it was i i spent a couple weeks in spain <laughs> <laughs> as a as a tourist <laughs> okay uh tammy is speaks spanish she's fluent in spanish she actually majored in that college so we enjoy going to Spanish-speaking country, Mexico, and it's funny because we don't look like we speak Spanish. Oh, I do not speak Spanish. <laughs> I, enough to get in trouble, I know. But, yeah. but it's funny when we're somewhere with a bunch of locals and they're speaking Spanish and she understands what they're saying. So she'll answer them in Spanish and they shut up real fast <laughs> and quit talking. And then I'll nod and laugh, and they think I speak Spanish. So, they, <laughs> so then we're good. Yeah. Until they start talking to you, and, yeah, and, and then it's quit, like they quit oh. talking about it. So. <laughs> All right, that's wonderful. All right. So yeah, I do not speak Spanish. Okay. All right. And I'm pretty rusty. <laughs> I've learned. We are so blessed to have these two as a part of Oral Baptist Church. They're very faithful. Every Sunday of being here, very faithful on Wednesday mornings, being a part of the Bible study uh, here at church. And uh, we just look forward to many more years of being able to be with you and have you as a part of Orville Baptist Church. Oh, thank you and, so much. Yes. And so do we. We do. Good. We, yeah. we are just as grateful to be here as you are to have us. Good. So thank you. Let me pray over you guys. Can I do that before Absolutely. we? Father God, I thank you for Rick and for Tammy. I pray, Lord, your richest blessings in this year that's coming. Father, you are the one who is leading and guiding their lives. And Father, as they submit to you, may you exalt them and lift them up. It says you, you will humble those who are exalted and exalt those who are humbled. And so humble these, Lord, and then exalt them for your glory, I pray. Thank you for them and what they mean to us. And more than that, what they mean to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's give them another round of applause.
All right, I have one more question, and I didn't get to ask it last week, and Linda said, hey, you didn't ask last week. And that is, every week I was going to ask you, did anybody get to share Jesus with somebody this week? Or did anybody get to ask the question, simple question, is there any need that you have that I can pray for you about? And so, in the last two weeks, has anybody shared that question with anybody or shared Jesus in the gospel with somebody? Raise your hand real high. All right, raise them up. Look, look, look. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, seven, eight, nine. All right, we're getting there. We're getting there. Praise God. Let's give God a hand. See, here's the thing. I believe we ought to rejoice when those come to know the Lord as Savior, and we do. But we also ought to rejoice when we step out in faith and share Him with others, because that is what He's called us to do. We don't have to do anything else. After we share Him with others, then He is the one who calls people to Himself. It's really easy. You can grab a track on the back. I sent one out this week to a friend from... Indiana that I knew that just found out this week he has cancer, stage four, not going to live long, doesn't know the Lord. I sent him a card of thanks and tell him I was praying for him, said, hey, what I really want is for you to read this and let's talk. So pray for, uh, pray for Leonard, if you would, as, uh, as he's dealing with something that he didn't know in his wife, Laura. All right? Well, let's stand again and have a time of worship. Thank you, praise team.
I just asked this, are you going to say anything? She said, I want to sing this song. <laughs> and she doesn't very often do that. <laughs> so, um, and um, I know that this song means an awful lot to her. It means a lot to me, too, um, because I've found that the longer that you serve him, the sweeter that he grows. Since I started for the kingdom, since my life he controls, since I gave my heart to Jesus. Won't you stand with him as we sing, His Name is Alive.
begin reading in just a minute in verse 36. A garden of redemption. Four beautiful vents on the way to Easter. There's Mary who is anointing Jesus before his burial, before his death. There's a time when he is with his disciples and he is showing his love to them by washing their feet and giving them a reminder that they will never forget of a supper they would never forget. And today, we see a beautiful picture of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. They say that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, though. And that is so true. I want to show you a couple of pictures of people. This is Hilary Gonzaga. Gonzaga. She was driving home with her two boys, five years old. They're twins. She pulled off the ramp on the interstate, saw that a car behind her was not going to stop. She jumped in front of her two boys, laying her body between them so that they would not be crushed, and she died. Just two weeks ago, they had her ceremony. Her mom said her body saved her grandsons. The grandsons' only remembrance of that moment was they saw mom jump, they saw her eyes open, and they closed for impact. And she said, or they said, they never saw her open her eyes again. Here is Jesse Manson. He is a Tampa police officer. There was a report of a wrong way driver on the interstate. Jesse would respond to that call. 
He would be staring down the interstate of headlights that were coming to him by this oncoming driver. Jesse would pull his cruiser in the path of that car to save others. And he gave his life. He leaves behind a wife, two boys, age 12 and 14, and a daughter, 10. A patrolman, friend of his, said this, Jesse and I had specific conversations about how to stop a wrong way driver. And that night he did extinctively what he had planned to do years ago. Save others by getting in the path of somebody else. He would say, his friend would say, this was not a car accident. This was done on purpose to save lives. Picture number three. If you would, one more please. It is Jesus in the garden. It is a garden with a name. It is the name Gethsemane, which means olive press. Pastor Mike has been there. He has been in this olive grove. He has been where Jesus was that night. He has seen the olive trees that maybe even Jesus was under because they say olive trees live a very, very long time. To his disciples that night, it wasn't a beautiful night. And in fact, it was a horrific night when things began to unfold. To Jesus, in his humanness, it wasn't a beautiful night because what was about to happen was going to be terrible. But to God the Father, it was a beautiful night, a beautiful display of love, a beautiful display of obedience. And for us who are here today, as we look back, we often do not think of Gethsemane as a beautiful place. But I believe as we look back and look at a Savior who is willing to die on a cross for our place, and to pay the penalty for our sins. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So let's behold this last night of Jesus' life. And as we look back and admire his great love for us. So stand if you would. Matthew 26 and in verse 36, let me get my glasses on here. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that would be James and John, along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father, lead us, I pray, into this passage. Allow us to see the beauty of your sacrifice and allow us to see your love for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This morning I'd like for us to look at this in three different passages, three different ways about this garden of redemption. The first one is Jesus is saying, my soul is sorrowful. My soul is sorrowful. And if you were Jesus, wouldn't you be sorrowful? I think I would be sorrowful. You knew what was coming. You had already told the disciples three times they just didn't get it. You had already heard that the religious leaders were making plans and plotting to kill you. You already knew that Judas had made a deal with them to sell Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. And Jesus, just before this, is going to tell his disciples, when I become arrested, the shepherd is going to be 
brought into custody and all of you are going to scatter. Wow. He already knew that Peter was not going to stay with him, but he was going to deny him not once, not twice, but three times before daybreak. He already knew that momentarily in this garden he was going to be arrested. Then he'd be falsely accused. He would be given a mockery of a trial. And within just a few hours, he would be on a cross. He knew it. When I was about 20, I went to a basketball game in Indiana. And I bought a program, and the program had a number on it. And I knew from going to the basketball games that at halftime, they would call one number. And that person got to come down out of the stands and to shoot a half-court shot for $200. So I was sitting there, and I had a premonition. The premonition was, you are going to shoot that shot at halftime. I could see myself out there shooting the shot at halftime. So much so, when it got to about the second quarter, my hands started to sweat. Because I knew it was just about ready to come. And I looked down as it got even closer to the crowd in front of me. And in Ohio, football is king. But in Indiana, basketball is king. And there were lots of people, maybe 1,500, 2,000 people there. I'm looking, how am I going to make my way down from where I'm seated down to the floor? I knew. I knew I was going to shoot that shot. I knew it. So, halftime came. They went on the announcing. I'd already looked at my number a number of times. I knew what my number was. I knew that they were going to call it. And they called out the number. And it wasn't mine. Do you think I'd tell you that story if it wasn't my number? Come on. It was my number. It really was. So I made my way down to the floor just like I had planned. My, I went out to the half court. They introduced me and said, you got one shot. Shoot half court for $200. So I lined up, and I shot the best I could. It, I can see it. It was going straight towards the goal, straight towards, right through the air hits the backboard, hits the rim, and hits the floor. I wish my premonition would have been of me making the shot instead of just taking the shot, but it wasn't. Can I tell you, Jesus didn't have a premonition that night. He didn't have a feeling that night. He knew what was going to happen. He knew what was going to take place at that moment. He had perfect knowledge. John MacArthur, in his commentary of this passage, writes something that I had to be able to share with you. He wrote, you see, Jesus not only died on the cross when he died on the cross, but he died on the cross every conscious moment before he died on the cross. Wow. Because in his knowledge, he had pre-lived through, every, through his own death, every conscious moment. And because he fully understood everything, he fully experienced it before it happened. It was little wonder that this man was called a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Pain was always there. And here it reaches its apex. It reaches the epitome. Wow. Wow. Here is one who is sorrowful in his soul. And who wouldn't it be? Point number two. Jesus would be one who would submit his will to God in everything. Verse 39 of this passage. Let's continue reading. Going a little farther, that is a little farther than... Peter, James, and John, he fell on his face 
to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And he went away a second time and he prayed, My father, if it is not possible this cup to, uh, for this cup to be taken away from me, unless I drink it, may your will be done. And then he came back, and he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left, and he went, he left them and went away once more and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. Jesus would go a little farther. One of the Gospels, each one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, share this account in some fashion or form. One of the Gospels says that he went a stone's throw from Peter, James, and John. Maybe that's 30 yards, or maybe that's 50 yards, just a little farther, just maybe beyond them, so that he could do what he needed to do, and that is to be alone with his father. He falls prostrate on the ground in utter despair. Complete submission. The terrible crisis to which there is no resource except one, and that is to call upon your father. To call upon one who would hear. The shadow of death was enveloped around him. The trees, I believe, made, sh made shadows for him. And the wave and the storms of this situation rolled over his soul. Yet, in the deep, he would call out to his Lord. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 and 8 gives us a little clear detail of this when it says, of this Jesus, who in the days of his flesh, when he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying, and tears unto him who was able to save him from death. And having been heard for his godly fear, though he was a son, yet learned obedience by the things which he suffered. There's one who the scripture says in a different place that he would offer up prayers and supplications with strong crying and with tears unto the one who is able to save him. My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. See, he's not trying to avoid redemption. He's just at a point of dire agony. Father, if there is any other way, to save your people. May this cup pass from me if there's any other way. But Lord, I know this, not my will, but yours be done. Mark's gospel account says this, Abba, Father. It shows how personal he was in this moment. Abba means daddy, daddy. All things are possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. Three times, not my will, not my will, not my will. But yours, Father, your will be done. What was this cup that Jesus was wanting to have removed? What is it he is referring to, a cup? I mean, is it like the cup that he had at the dinner earlier this evening? What kind of cup is he talking about? This cup is a symbol of what he was going to experience in just a few hours. It is the cup of God's full wrath 
upon the sin that you and I deserved. And he will drink all of it. He experienced everything that he knows is coming. It's so unlike today, in today's criminal justice systems, that we have a parole. You, do, you get sentenced to this, and you may do a half or maybe a third of the time. There was none of that in Jesus' case. There was no shortened time for good behavior. What shortened time did he have? What good behavior could he do? He was going to be dead in less than 12 hours. maybe 15. There's no lenient district attorneys who are soft on crime as we see today. This punishment for sin was for death. The wages of sin is death. And Jesus would drink all of God's wrath for us. Point number three, the garden of of redemption my redemption has begun i believe that the work of god in salvation is beginning not just on a cross not even at the place of him being whipped and beaten but i believe it is happening even now as he is going to be arrested let's look at the passage of scripture beginning in verse 45 Then Jesus returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him a large crowd, armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. And going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came to do. And then the men stepped forward and seized and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword away. Put it back in its place. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do uh, Do you think that I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scripture be fulfilled that say that this must happen in this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then all the disciples deserted and fled. Wow. John's gospel has these words. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. This was a favorite place for Jesus and his disciples to pray, and Judas picks that place to betray his Lord. Betray means to expose one's, to one's country, uh, one's country, one's group, or a person to danger by treachery, giving information to the enemy. It means to be disloyal to to be unfaithful to, to desert, and Judas did all. It's hard for me to even comprehend this passage. I mean, it's one thing to betray someone that you might have casually met or someone that you just know about, but it's totally different to have someone betray you that is a friend. 
or someone who has been with you day and night for the last three and a half years. And I can see Jesus thinking and saying to Judas as he stood before him, do you think that I don't know what you're doing? Don't you know that I'm aware that this kiss is your devious sign? Don't you know, Judas, that I see the darkness that is in your heart? And of all the people, Judas, in the world, you have chosen to betray the Son of Man? Judas, you betrayed me because you were never a true believer. Your betrayal shows who you really are. And the scripture says, with him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs. Do you see the force of evil that is around him? And one of the disciples, the scripture tells us it was Peter, draws his sword and makes a swipe. I believe he's trying to cut off the head and not the ear of the one they would call Malchus. And he takes a swipe, slices off his ear. And Jesus says, enough, no more of that. John's gospel says, don't you think that I have come to drink the cup of my father? That's why I'm here. And Jesus, one of the other gospels tell us, bent down to Malchus's ear and healed it. Now, if that wouldn't make chills go up your neck and your hair stand on end, I don't know who you would think you would be arresting. Someone who would repair or even replace your ear on the side of your head. Jesus said, I sat in the temple every day teaching and you never laid a hand on you never even touched me. But now it is night. Now it is your time. Now is the time for your victory. Do you know what amazes me? Jesus came to the garden where he knew what was going to happen. He knew Judas was on his way with the chief priest henchman. Yet, Jesus was following God's plan for our salvation. Jesus remembered why he was there. He knew why he came from heaven. He remembered it began in another garden, a garden of Eden, where those who were there, God's creation, would rebel against holy God, and God would, would banish them from his perfect garden and put them out with a curse into a world that they had never known. And now Jesus arrives at another garden, a garden of Gethsemane, and there is a garden where redemption is about to begin. Oh, he remembers why he's there. He knows why he has come. Gethsemane will forever stand for where the Savior would not run away. He would not shrink back. He would not succumb to his temptation and the anguish of knowing what was to come. He would not hide or let anyone else defend him. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. You do know that Jesus didn't have to die, don't you? Oh, we wouldn't have been saved. But Jesus didn't have to die. We wouldn't have never found salvation. We wouldn't be here today, but he didn't have to die. That was his choice. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to lay down his life, but he didn't have to. He came to say, I am not going to do my will. I'm coming to do the Father's will. And my Father's will is that I would lay down my life 
and take on the full wrath of my father for the sins of many. There's a song we sing during Easter season. And the chorus said, comes from this passage. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and to set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. If he died for you, and he did. Will you, will I live for him? Let's pray. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And for many who are in that place that night, it was horrible. The disciples would look at it that evening and the nights to come and say, what a horrible night it was. And Jesus would, would be in anguish. Luke's gospel says that he was such travail that when he sweated, the capillaries in his head broke and he sweated drops of blood. Oh, how much pressure he was under. And thank you, Lord, for hearing his prayer. And thank you, Lord, for sending an angel to strengthen him while he prayed. But most of all, thank you, Lord, that he was willing to set aside himself and his will and lay down his life for us. And redemption would begin in a garden. Father, we're here today. May you strengthen us for this week as we go about our activities. May we follow the example of Jesus. May we too seek to lay down our lives for others. That in doing so, that Jesus would exalt us. And then in doing so, that we would exalt him. This is all about his glory. This is all about his beauty. This is all about him. So Lord, today as we have a time of invitation, may you speak to hearts in this room. May they, Lord, respond as you are calling them to do in the same way that you did in the garden. Not my will, but yours, Lord, be done. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, thanks for watching today. You know, I never considered the whole picture. With all the anguish, with all the strife, with all the heartache, and all the pain that Jesus was going through. But when we look at it through his eyes, we can see it's really beautiful. Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 16, verse 25, if you strive to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give your life for me, you will find it. So this week, as you go out and be about uh, this week's activities, look for ways to be able to give up your life and be more like your Savior. Hey, as always, if there's anything I can do to help you this week, don't hesitate to give me a call. My number is 330-465-2356. And until next week, may God richly bless you.